We've already been singing into the theme of uh, this morning's passage as we continue our way through Mark's gospel. Um, I forgot to say that if you need uh, translation, there's a link on your sheet there um, so you can have what I say uh, translated into your own language. Um, Yeah, as we've been praying and thinking into this theme, as we've been building up to it over the last few weeks, we're building up to the cross, which is the center point of human history, Uh, the point at which Jesus gave his life to defeat sin and death and Satan by dying and rising again. But if we don't understand the bit we're looking at this morning, that doesn't make as much sense as it should. And in fact, if you know nothing about Christianity and then you you ask the question, oh, well, why is the cross the symbol of Christianity? It's weird because it's the worst ever form of public execution devised by human beings in human history. And so it is weird that it would be the center point of our religion. Why would, why would we have as the very thing that we celebrate the most, that we put on top of church buildings, that we put as the symbol on our, on our logo, why would we have an instrument of torture and execution? And I think the place where we can understand that the most is this passage we're looking at in Mark chapter 14, where Jesus is in the the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Gethsemane is um, Hebrew Aramaic for an olive press. And so it was a, a garden of olives. It was the Mount of Olives that Jesus went to. And he was praying near where there would have been an olive press. And the fact that we're reminded of that name is helpful because when, if an olive wants to produce olive oil, it needs first to be crushed. And olive oil in Scripture is a symbol of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God's grace. Um, and so we need to understand why was it that Jesus needed to be crushed in order to pour out his grace? And so this is, I mean, every passage of Scripture we come to, we're coming to the Word of God Himself. Um, but I have a sense of, sort of awe and nervousness, an extra sense of awe and nervousness as I come to this passage. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to read it through. I'll make a very few comments, and then we're going to go back over and see if we can draw out the implications for us in here. And we're going to see it under the theme that I put on the, on the screen, the cup of wrath and the swap of love. The cup of wrath. Wrath is an old English word for anger, uh, the deep anger of God. The idea that God would be angry, why, why is that? We're going to explore that this morning. And then the swap of love. What was it that Jesus did to swap places with us? And as we come to this passage, we've been singing into it and thinking into it, we we can come with that sense of, God, why do you leave prayers seemingly unanswered? And this is an amazing place to go to see that. How is it, God, that you can be sovereign? How is it that you can be in control even where evil happens at the most deep and painful level? This is a great place to come to. And how is it in the midst of all that seeming unanswered prayer and pain, can we know that we are loved? And I think if we understand this passage, which may on first reading feel a bit strange, but if we understand this, Deeply, we will know that we are loved so much that it will completely change our attitude to everything. And perhaps especially as we get to the end, we'll see 
our attitude to prayer. If we know we are loved, one of the greatest outpourings of knowing you are loved like this will be that you want to pray. Well, let's read it. Read it together. Mark chapter 14. And I'm actually going to read from verse 31, even though our passage technically starts at verse 32. So there on your sheets, Mark 14, verse 31. So they've shared the Lord's Supper together for the first time. The Passover, Jesus said, the Passover pointed to him. His body broken was the bread that they took. His blood shed was the wine, the cup that he passed around for them, which is the new covenant in his blood, bringing in a new era. But in the midst of that Passover pointing to him, that celebration that it's all about Jesus, comes this pain that he's going to die But then the disciples all confidently say, like Peter, well, verse 31, Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. I don't know what your attitude is that you came to church with this morning. I'm a good Christian. Maybe that that was their attitude. Jesus, we're good Christians. They wouldn't have used the term Christian. They used disciple or follower of Jesus. We will follow you to the end, even if it involves dying. And that sense of confidence in themselves. We're the faithful ones. By now they've seen Judas slink off. They perhaps know already or see stirrings that he's going to betray. But but the rest, the other 11, they are faithful and true. But Jesus said even Peter would disown him. And Peter's just denying it. No way. No way. I'm strong. Satan can attack me in that way. There's no way I could be led away from you. I will die with you. I have such confidence that I'm a good follower of Jesus. And so they follow him. Verse 32, to a place called Gethsemane, the olive press. And Jesus said to his disciples, his followers, sit here while I pray. And then he took Peter and James and John, his closest followers, the ones he'd spent most time with. He took them along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. It's hard to exaggerate just how deeply distressed and troubled he was. You'll see on your sheets below, there's a little quote from Luke 22. It says, being in anguish, As he prayed more earnestly, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He is incredibly deeply distressed. What's what's going on here? Well, he says, verse 34, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. He's just told them just how full of distress, anxiety, fear, trouble, overwhelm that he is. And they know that he said that he's, he's heading to die. They find that still very, very confusing. They know he needs them right now. And he says, stay here and keep watch. You are my closest friends. You're here with me. This is my moment of greatest need. They wouldn't have seen him this distressed ever before. I need you, Jesus says. I need you now. You've told me that you would be willing to die die for me. I need you now. And so going a little further, hoping that they would be staying and praying, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father. Perhaps we're used to this language. But no Jewish rabbi would pray with such intimacy to God as their father. Abba, father. Personal name that a child would use for their father. Abba, father, he said. Such a deep intimacy with his father God. Total dependence on his father. Constant communion 
closeness with his father. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, not what I want, but what you will, what you want. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Praying for an hour, that's a long time to pray nonstop, isn't it? Once more, verse 39, Jesus went away and prayed the same thing. Deep anguish, Abba, Father. Everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Verse 40, when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus knows what's coming. He's in control. And yet he's been in this deep anguish that this cup might pass from him. But now he seems resolved to go ahead. And just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. And with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. A big crowd of armed soldiers. Verse 44, Now the betrayer, that's Judas, had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And kissed him as a friend. The reason he knew where Jesus was is because we're told in Luke's gospel it was his custom to go there and to pray. This was the place he went to pray, where he took his followers for time with him and with the Father. And his friend came and gave him the kiss of a friend. In verse 46, the men seized Jesus and arrested him. And then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. We're told that that's Peter elsewhere. Maybe Peter was a bit embarrassed. Mark was possibly Peter's scribe. (laughs) Anyway, Luke and Matthew tell us that was Peter cut off his right ear. We're told elsewhere that Jesus heals that. Mark doesn't delve into the detail there. We're just left with the fact that the very followers who'd said that they would follow Jesus' every word can't even remember to love their enemies and pray for their persecutors in the moment of Jesus' greatest need. And so Jesus rebukes them. And then he looks to those who are going to arrest him. Verse 48, am I leading a rebellion? said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. In the original language, it's put the other way around. Verse 50, then deserted him and fled everyone. He was completely abandoned to then be taken off to his trial, to be falsely accused, to be stripped, to be beaten, to be flogged, to be hung on a cross. And then people suspect that this young man in the next verse is Mark himself, because it doesn't come up in Matthew, Luke, or John. 
Verse 51, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Even to the point of total and utter shame and humiliation, no one was willing to hang out with Jesus. They were willing to abandon their most expensive thing. Linen in those days was very, very expensive to weave. And so to leave that behind, that's, that's expensive. And then to run in nakedness and shame and be the first streaker recorded in human history. <laughs> That means you really don't want to be there. As one of the followers who said, I'll stick with you no matter what, they all abandoned him. If we understand this passage... We can understand that it doesn't matter how confidently we feel we could perform as a Christian. We will let him down. And we do let him down. And if we're honest with ourselves, then we won't end up saying like Peter, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Instead, we'll start flipping this on its head and start realizing that when Jesus warns us, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He means it. He means it. If you think you can perform for Jesus on your own without relying on him, you've missed the point. You need him. They weren't scared. They weren't overwhelmed. They weren't understanding what was going on in Jesus' heart when he was overwhelmed, which means that when he was ready, they were not. I think the first thing we need to get from this passage is to understand the horror of our sin. Sin just means falling short of God's standards. But the whole attitude of sin is that we would be in charge, that we would be in control. It's pushing God out of the picture and saying, I can do this. I don't need you. And if you want to know how serious that attitude is, just have a look again at verses 35 and 36. Going a little further, Jesus fell to the ground and prayed... He fell to the ground. This is, this is desperate, face-on-the-floor type prayer. Desperate and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. The hour is the hour where he heads to his death. And he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for, for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. This is intimate language, intimate in the presence of God. And yet what he's asking for God to remove is something terrifying. And I've put there on your sheet an an understanding that the first readers would have had as they knew their Old Testaments. Just have a look down at the the verse from Psalm 75, verse 8. It says, In the hand of the Lord is a cup flowing, is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. This idea of a a cup of anger. Or Isaiah 51, verse 17. Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You have drained it to its dregs, the goblet that makes people stagger. The cup of his wrath, the cup of his anger. I think, why, why would God be angry? And yet, Have you ever watched a film where there's an evil leader in that film threatening to capture and kill innocent families? And as the film builds and builds, the more you want the destruction of that evil person, the more you want them gone because of the horror that they are doing. Well, if we can feel a sense of anger against even fictional evil, how much more 
would the God of justice and peace look on his broken world and those who've turned away from him and are doing evil towards each other? How much more would his anger build and ultimately be poured out against that kind of evil? But the thing is, we so often point the finger away from ourselves and we see the evil in others, but we don't see that actually if we had the opportunity, we would be capable of carrying out such evil. As as you see the horror between Israel and Gaza and as you listen to the different stories, You can hear people thinking, they've been so horrible to us. Those in Palestine, those in the Gaza Strip, they have been so horrible to us. They've oppressed us for so long. We've seen the bombs fall. We've seen the innocent die, that they deserve whatever's coming to them. And then on the flip side, you hear, they've been so horrible to us. They've attacked us. They've murdered and raped and killed. And the anger against evil, and you kind of understand the anger against evil, but then It's carrying on on both sides, and the more we're oppressed, the more likely we are to become the oppressor because we don't have grace in us. And yet, what is weird here is that you've got the most innocent, perfect, beautiful, good, kind lover of his enemies who is about to face the cup of God's wrath. And when Jesus asks, take this cup from me, it's a genuine request. Even though from before the world began, Father and Son predestined the plan as we were singing in those wonderful words. Jesus, as to his human nature, knew what he was going to face. And he knew the horror of it. And actually, if Jesus had not prayed that prayer, this is not a prayer of weakness, this is a prayer of strength. If he had not prayed that prayer, he would not be truly holy. He had to pray that prayer, take this cup from me, because there was no instinct in our holy Savior ever to want to drink a cup that would lead him to be cut off from his Father's beautiful face, shining down on him in perfect relationship, a relationship that we can only get glimpses of. He was right not to want to drink that cup. He did not deserve to drink that cup, the cup of God's wrath and anger against human sin, the sin in our hearts that means that the people we hurt the most are the people we love the most. Jesus was never like that. He was not looking forward to saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he hung on that cross, cut off and bearing the full force of the anger of his father, literally taking hell for you and me. He knew he was going to experience the full force of the anger of God against all human sin in all human history. For those who would trust in him. He prays. Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will. But what you will. And the father says. In terrifying silence, my son, no, it is not possible for me to take this cup from you. And so being in anguish, that verse from Luke 22 at the bottom of your sheet says, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This only makes sense if what Jesus had to face in death was way worse than any death any other human being has ever faced. Because there are many, many people in human history who have gone to their death far more bravely than this. In fact, all of Jesus' followers died 
more willingly than this. In fact, they saw it as a privilege to be able to die for their Savior. And so why was it that they were braver, as it were, facing their death than he was? Why was he struggling so much in anxiety and terror and fear that he was the capillaries in his blood vessels, I'm not exactly sure how it worked, were bursting into his sweat glands so that sweat was falling from him like drops of blood? I don't know if you um, read the uh, Harry Potter books. You may have opinions on whether or not um, those things are, are good things to, to, uh, to read. I think it's full of um, an amazing sort of gospel storyline. I don't know if J.K. Rowling knew that she was following the ultimate storyline, but all good stories do. But in it, there's a little bit about something called a pensive. Anyone who's read the Harry Potter books know what the pensive is? The pensive is, is a kind of cup that you stick your head in, and in doing so, you get to relive past memories. You get to see into the mind and the, into the perspective of those who came before you. Now in this, it's as if Jesus is faced with a pensive, but in it are all the evil things that you or I have ever thought and said and done. the dark places that we've been in our attitude to others, the images that we've actively searched out or formulated in our minds that show that we're perhaps not as good as we think we are, the self-centeredness, the cruelty, the pervertedness, all the evil of the world, and he sticks his head in that cup and he sees that he is going to bear accountability he is going to face the consequences of his father as anger against all of that. And he asks for that cup to be taken away. And the father's silence makes it very, very clear that there is no other way to be saved. When the eternal Son of God asks his Father to take a cup from him, and the eternal Son of God delights to give good gifts to his child, and instead gives him the most painful, horrific experience that we could possibly imagine that would pile up upon millions upon millions upon millions of horror and disgrace onto his own Son, you know that there is absolutely no other way to be saved. So Christianity is either complete rubbish or it is the only way to come to know God and to have a relationship with him. If this is true, if this happened, and this passage doesn't make sense as something that would be invented because the hero is a gibbering wreck. What invented story would have a gibbering wreck as the hero? This isn't made up, which means Islam is completely and utterly false and it is an evil religion because it says Jesus did not go to the cross. Either this is complete rubbish or every other religion that says that it's got a way, a pathway to God, you can work your way to God, you can be good enough for God, is complete and utter rubbish. If you say there is another way to be saved, then you spit in the loving face of the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we want to know what happened as Jesus died on that cross, then have a look down to 2 Corinthians 5.21 there on your sheets. This is a, wor a verse worth memorizing. It says... God made him, the Lord Jesus, who had no sin for us. Sorry. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God made him. God made Jesus, who was perfect, 
who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God does not want us to come to him like like the disciples and say, I'll fight for you to the very end. He wants us to know that we have nothing to offer him. And what we need as we face the cup of wrath is we need the swap of love. What we see here is that God treated Jesus as we deserve so that he could treat us as Jesus deserved. Not only is there no other way to be saved, but this shows us just how much the Father and Son together love us. That by the Spirit they would give us this message so that we can be brought into a relationship. It was Jesus' will to have the cup removed from him. He said, take this cup from me. But his greatest will, his greatest desire was to do what his father wanted. And as the father looks on his son, we know, we know, don't we, if we see a mother in hospital with her child, looking on the child in anguish and pain and and praying and longing for the child to be well. We know that you can't separate the pain of parent and child. In many ways, the parent bears it more. As the father looks on his son, what love he has for us, that he would let Jesus go through that for us. There is no other way. Because God loved us enough to give us his son. If we understand this, it is immense comfort to us that God would love us this much. And one of the ways we will know we understand it more is the impact it will have on our prayer life. Just have a look again at verses 37 and 38. Jesus returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. The very ones who said, we'll go to you, we'll die with you. You know, if it's obvious what the work is, we'll do it. I think we often think that. If it's obvious what the work is, we'll do it. And then the most confident of them, Jesus singles out, Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? You think you'd be able to die with me? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter did not know the scale of the temptation. I think had he known the scale of the temptation, of how much he was exposing himself to Satan's lies, to end up making him turn away from his master and deny his Lord, as we'll see next week, he would have changed his attitude from, Jesus, I'm there for you, into, Jesus, I need you. And I just want us to look as we close... I'm assuming someone's told the kids that we need a bit more time. As we close and as we, as we sing out the theme, that something changes between this point and Acts chapter 1. Just have a look at the, those verses on your sheet in Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. Um, that just means a, about a kilometer um, because you weren't supposed to walk very far. Otherwise, that was seen as work on the Sabbath day. So a short walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Maybe that was even at the olive press. We don't know, but it was definitely in the Mount of Olives, and that's where the olive press was. So in Luke, we're told that it was Jesus' custom to go to the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane to pray. And then after Jesus has died and risen, but before he sent his spirit, 
to empower them, their mindset has shifted. They're going to the place of prayer. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, who deserted him, John, who deserted him, James, who deserted him, and Andrew, who deserted him, and Philip, who deserted him, and Thomas, who deserted him, and Bartholomew, who deserted him, and Matthew, who deserted him, and James, son of Alphaeus, who deserted him, and Simon the Zealot, who deserted him, and Judas, a different Judas, the son of James, who deserted him. And they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Their mindset had shifted, and their attitude to the fact that they needed the Lord had changed. They were no longer saying, I can do this. They were saying, I can't do this. They were obeying Jesus, waiting for empowerment by his Spirit. But their hearts had already been changed by the cross and the resurrection. They knew they should have faced the cup of God's wrath. They knew when Jesus said, watch and pray so you do not fall into temptation, that he meant it, that he really meant it. And he doesn't just want them to give a few minutes here and there every so often and then go off to work. He wants them to pray constantly, together when they can, and praying in the Spirit on all occasions when they're not together. Their whole attitude to prayer changed because they knew they needed Jesus. And they saw that what he faced in the garden wasn't just, wasn't just him praying. They looked back and they realized that he was winning a victory in that garden of Gethsemane in the heavenly realms that meant he was ready to go to the cross. They saw that what had shifted in him from the sweating drops of blood, anxiety to rise, here comes my betrayer, and heading to the cross, was that he had pleaded with the Father, that he'd heard the Father's voice. He knew the Father's leading. He followed in the footsteps of the Holy Spirit, and he went to the cross to die for them and to give his life for them. And then he called them to be like him. Go back to that 2 Corinthians verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And what does it look like to be the righteousness of God? It means that we depend on our Father in prayer. And actually Jesus himself said, I do nothing on my own but only what the Father gives me. Jesus was a man who was constant, constant, constant in prayer. And if we don't pray corporately and individually, then we don't think we need Jesus. That's what we're saying. We're saying, I don't need Jesus right now. Which means we won't see an outpouring of the Spirit because we're not waiting for an outpouring of the Spirit. Because we don't think we need Jesus. We're all right trundling along. Oh yeah, there's the church stuff and then there's the work stuff. No, it's all one thing. I think if we understand Gethsemane and we realize the love of the Father for us, we realize there's no other way, we realize the battle Jesus won for us, then suddenly our horizon is filled with everything is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. I need him all the time. I'm desperate for him all the time. I need his guidance all the time. And I need his spirit to empower me to live for him. This passage teaches us that Jesus is willing to die for those who fail to watch and pray. He paid the price for those who fail. When I fail to get on my knees as I should, when I fail to pray as I should, there is grace for me aplenty. He has died. He has given his life for me. I am a rubbish, rubbish prayer. But if I stop at that point, I don't realize he's called me to righteousness to seeking my Heavenly Father in prayer. And I want our attitude as a church to change so that we spend more time, literally or metaphorically, on our knees, asking the Father to fill us with a deeper sense of His love and to shape us and transform us, to find ways that could be said of us They all joined together constantly in prayer. Did they not have day jobs? Yes, they did. 
Did they not have families to look after? Yes, they did. Did they not have kids who kept them up at night? Yes, they did. But they found a way to join together constantly in prayer. And my prayer life is anemic, and I need you. And your prayer life is anemic. It's lacking life. and We need each other. Sarah, Sim, the musicians, do you want to come up? The kids are coming in. It's okay. There'll be a bit more noise. We're going to sing our last song, which I think is He Will Hold Me Fast. Is that right? To remind ourselves that it's not us fighting for him. He's the one who will hold us fast. But we don't presume on that. Jesus wants us to push through and to watch and pray that we do not fall into temptation, and to find ways to spur each other on to be a church that really prays, that really prays.